Hello, my dear students, and welcome to the first technical lecture with this course. If you remember, in the Zero lecture, we have illustrated put together the scope of the course targeting the sensor on a chip technology. And definitely, one of the main building blocks for the sensor on a chip is the sensor itself. Years ago, I think you already have studied a lot of a lot of kinds and types and classifications of sensors that include gas, environmental, uh, biomedical, and so on. And I think that you cordially know that sensors are found or are fabricated maybe hundreds of years ago. So sensors in general are these devices used to convert some physical change. And here in the world, physical change may include everything, it includes change in temperature in any type of gas, carbon dioxide, for example, uh, <clears throat> any type of biomedical change, uh, for example, uh, lactate, glucose, blood pressure, uh, any type of blood flow, whatever, into an electrical output signal that can be processed. So this is the main definition or this is the main function of a sensor. This is a general definition for the word sensor. Sensors can be found in different ways and in different technologies. However, as I just mentioned, our key parameter here is to have what we can call a smart sensor. The word smart sensor does, does mean not only sensing this physical phenomena to be sensed, but also it's related to managing, processing, transmitting this quantity. So for example, you have to process this data so that it can be converted to some sort of a data or a data type to be understood by your reader. Whenever you are going to consider a wireless sensor network, for example, you have to consider a transmitter part and a receiver part maybe in your node. If you are targeting a self-powered node, then you, are, you should consider some sort of a storage bank, battery or whatever, maybe an energy harvesting source, and definitely you need an energy management network or a circuit that link this storage elements or energy harvesters with the circuits. Additionally, a lot of aspects should be considered while designing these sensors related to the sensor sensitivity, the limit of, it, uh, of sensing, the energy management concerning the power consumption of the network or of, or of the node, how we manage the power, how we manage the energy, maybe by having an active mode and sleep mode with a certain frequency depending on the physical change, physical uh, change or the physical phenomena itself. So all these aspects are scaled up once we transfer from an ordinary passive element representing a sensor, for example, when you consider a thermocouple, for example, turning into a, a huge schematic with a lot of blocks to represent what we can call a smart sensing unit. Herein, the word sensor on a chip become essential. It's simply the, the process of integrating all these schematics into one node or a one chip, so that instead of having discrete blocks connecting with wires, which is very bulky and definitely this is not professional, to have all this into one chip, so that it's very easily to be embedded everywhere. Maybe sometimes for biomedical, this can be a uh, some sort of a wearable electronics can be a um, under scan technology or whatever in other environmental application it can be embedded in a smart uh, and green buildings and so on so herein the process is not only of an integration 
the process is also related to what we can call the compatibility of your system. What I mean by compatibility is whenever you are considering an, an on-trip, an IC technology, basically that means that all your blocks should be integrated in this format, should be integrated in this architecture accordingly. One of the needed aspects with that is to have your sensor, which is of course the main building block of the of the smart sensor, to have it in a what we can call a CMOS technology. Here in this lecture, we are going to consider a very famous, maybe the one of the most top famous sensors worldwide, which is the temperature sensors. And whenever you are going to call a temperature sensor, I think you will have a huge amount of examples in your mind demonstrating different types of temperature sensors. But our challenge here is not to sense temperature. Our challenge here is how to make this sensor CMOS compatible. How to make this sensor compatible with our CMOS technology so that it can be later on a part of a smart sensor on a sensor on chip technology. I recommend here using the reference precise temperature sensor in CMOS technology. Fortunately, it's a Springer reference Springer book series. So for our Egyptian student using the EKP link, you can download it for free. That's that's actually one of the reasons why we select this reference. And also, so let's start demonstrating the sensor. Okay, so this is a very basic um, um, schematic for an initial attempt to make a CMOS temperature-based uh, sensor. Before going into the details of the sensor, let me first start with uh, making a very uh, quick and brief um, illustration uh, for, or maybe flashback, a very quick fl flashback uh, into the basics of this schematic. So generally speaking, my dear students, uh, here this schematic is uh, based on what we can call a bipolar junction transistor. So. A bipolar junction transistor is simply a transistor of three terminal. It's a three terminal transistor. We have the base, and we have the emitter, and we have the collector. We have uh, two very basic configuration for this transistor. It can be NBN or a PMP. In our case, we are using a PMP transistor. So using the, 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 the name or the, the concept beyond the terminology, this is the emitter where the carrier is emitted and this is the collector. So where the carrier is, or are corrected, sorry. So, so simply the, the motion of the hose will be in this direction. That's why you have an arrow here indicating this direction because simply, as you know, the direction of the current is typically the same as the direction of Hose. So when the hose are moving from the emitter to the collector, that means the current is moving in the same direction. And also that base terminal is the controlling terminal to determine why the um, current is moving or not. Simply um, the, 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 the condition to, to turn on the transistor is having this voltage, which is generally we call it VPE, but in this case it's VEP because this is a BNB ch channel or a BNB transistor, sorry. So generally this voltage should be greater than the building voltage, which is roughly 0.7. If this occurs, then the current will be moved here. And then we have what's called the VEC voltage, which is the voltage drop between the emitter and the collector. And accordingly, we have this, uh, I think you know, it, this very famous ID curve representing the uh, transistor. And here we have the VCE and we, here we have the RC. I'm here assuming absolute values, and this is for a certain RIP. And we have two regions. This is what we can call the tried region. And this is the VCE, or uh, sorry, the, the saturation region. So this is how the IV curve looks like. But let's uh, consider it from another point of view. So let's back to this, the, the main schematic of a transistor, which is here. 
So in this schematic, we have, as I mentioned, this is a metal, and this is a basin, this is a collector, and as a configuration, or in terms of a doping, this is a P and P. So one can see this bipolar junction transistor at the coupling of its UPN junctions, as you know. So here we have a base emitter PN junction, which is the first PN junction, and here we have a base collector PN junction, so this is the second PN junction. So one of the very famous tricks in technology, in CMS technology, when you need to make an, a, a, a PN junction, uh, a diode, uh, still using the, the transistor configuration, is to deactivate one of these two PN junctions, keeping only the one acting as a PN junction or as, as a diode. So this activation is simply happen with making a short circuit here. So by short circuiting the, the connection between the base and the collector, as you can see, now you deactivate this PN junction, keeping only the basic metal PN junction working as a dot. And as you can see here, the, vo the voltage here, which is VDE, will be typically the same as the voltage here, which, which is VCE. So usually these, these um, transistors are working in the tried region, uh, or what we call, I'm sorry, that's not the tried, it's called the active region. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Uh, maybe it's a tried in the most, but it's here in the active region, I'm sorry. So usually these transistors are working in the active region because simply in order to turn on all of this transistor, you have to make this voltage is equal to 0.7. So by putting this equal to 0.7, that definitely means that this also is 0.7 and this is greater than VCE sat, which is usually around the 0.2, which makes this usually work in the active region. So this is, a transistor that is turned to be a PN junction by deactivating uh, or shortcutting the base collector junction. Back to our knowledge about it, uh, uh, back to our knowledge about the PN junction. So in a PN junction, we know that the current is related to the, to the voltage in an exponential relation. So this exponential relation will I equals I saturation e to the power V over VT Minus one. I believe that all of you know this relation uh, very well. So, in this case, my dear students, by or by monitoring this relation, here we see that the voltage drop on, on our PN junction is simply this voltage, which is, which is the same as this voltage, which, which is VPE. So we can say that the current flow here is equal to our situation, it is a power. Of So, following this equation, so following this equation, we can say that I equals Is e to the power VPE over VT minus one. As I just mentioned, the condition here is forced toward having this VPE in the on state. I mean, from a PN junction point of view, in order to make this transistor on, you should have a VPE greater than the building voltage so that the transistor is turned to on. Otherwise, the transistor is in the cutoff mode, which lead to have an exponential term with a value much greater than one, making the option of ignoring this one with respect to the VPE, leading to what we can call I equals IS e to the power VPE over VT. Now, using this relation, my dear students, you can shuffle it somehow to say VPE equals VT len I over IS. And please don't forget that this VT or this um, temperature the temperature voltage is equals to K T over Q len I over IS, where K is Boltzmann constant, T is temperature in Kelvin, and Q is the unit charge one point six times ten power negative twenty in Kelvin. Again, current I if the current moving is a diode and IS is a saturation current. So this a general equation you can use for a PN junction in the format 
or in the architecture we just demonstrate. Now, let's turn back. Let's turn back to the schematic we are investigating, which is a typical, or it should act as a typical temperature sensor. Here, the schematics uh, is, a schematic, is, is as, as following. Here we have this VCC supply with this current I moving into a transistor. And then we have another current source, which is P times I, where P is a constant, connected to another bipolar junction transistor. As you can see, bases are connected, collectors are connected, and bases and collectors are short-circuited here. So these two transistors are acting as a PN junction dot. So let's say that this is Q1 and this is a Q2. So we have this as a VPE1 and this is a VPE2. Using the equation we just reached, we can write an equation for VPE1 and an equation for VPE2. So for VPE1, we can say that KT over Q len I over I S, where I the current flowing is this transistor and I S is the situation current. This is VP1. So for VPE2, we can say K T over Q len. Now the current flowing in the transistor is P times R. And the current is IS. As you see, my dear students, I did hear an assumption, assuming that the saturation current for the, for, for both transistor is typically the same. This is what we can call the coupling or the matching condition. So we are assuming here a full matching between the two transistors. Maybe in the next slides, we are going to consider this assumption more deeply. Now, if I pick up the voltage here, which is VPE2 minus VPE1, which is simply the subtraction of these two equations, we call delta VPE equals KT over Q. And then the subtraction of these two len will, uh, will end up with a fractional. So it will be len P as simply I will be canceled with I, IS will be canceled with IS, and then we have a P. And I can rewrite this equation by this is in the form K over Q, len B, T. Okay, so what this is, what is this equation? Simply, as you can see, it's a direct relation between temperature and voltage. Whenever the temperature changes, the voltage will change. And this relation has a constant here, which is K over Q len B. So it's a constant simply because it's a temperature independent parameter. And this is a very important process. Why? One of you can ask me a question. In this equation, we still have a relation between a voltage and the temperature. So whenever the temperature changes, the voltage will change as well. So why we why we didn't use this equation? This is simply because the term K over Q when I over IS, which is should be the constant in this relation, is not is not is not no longer a constant because simply the current is a, temp a temperature dependent and the situation current also is a temperature dependent. So using this equation directly as a temperature sensor is not possible. However, by making this differential structure for the sensor you dilute it or actually you ignore or you reject the effect of INIS with respect to temperature and you make your temperature uh, you, you make your temperature directly proportional to the voltage with a purely constant term which is k over q n p additionally you can see you can see here the impact of having this p because k and q are uh, pure constant an ideal constant uncontrollable constant but p is a controllable constant. So you can now adjust the sensitivity of your transistor or the sensitivity of your sensor by 
playing with or controlling the speed. Ideally speaking, and even from logic, B cannot be equals to one because simply B equals to one. You can see that here, line one is equal to zero. So you will not have any sort of variation or if you if you observe it conceptually, you can see if you put here P equals one, that means that the current flow here and the current flow here are identical. So you will not have any sort of a, of a difference between VPE1 and VPE2. So the P is the distinguishing factor between these two branches, making the, possible, the possibility to correct temperature uh, in terms of voltage, of course. So this is a very basic um, concept or basic schematic toward having a, a temperature sensor. As you can see, it's a CMOS-based temperature sensor because simply we are doing this sensing mechanism using a, a transistor, a BGT technology, which can be part of an, a CMOS technology. So that's why we are uh, we we can consider this as a, a appropriate schematic for um, the CMOS uh, technology. But let's see more and more advanced uh, schematics still again in the same direction. So I will uh, share my presentation slides again. Okay, so this is a basic uh, uh, schematic, but now this is uh, somehow a more advanced schematic. So let's see uh, this one. Okay, so this left hand side is typically the same as uh, the one we already did in the first um, in the first uh, series. So it's typically the same uh, structure, uh, but. Um, here we just uh, um, demonstrate uh, an important uh, point regarding the matching between the transistors. So in the previous case, we consider a full match of transistors. Here we are considering some sort of a mismatching parameter with a ratio R. So our first step is simply to redesign the sensor considering this R. Then we have a third branch to be added with another current source, it's called I2, which generates some sort of a voltage here. Then another change with respect to the initial schematic is now that these two branches, the main two branches of VBE2 and VBE1 are now subtracted, which is usually or commonly, but um, or after subtraction, this is multiplied by a factor called alpha, and we call this VB tabs. And then we add these two voltages, the voltage coming from the operational amplifier and the voltage coming from the third branch to have what's called a VD reference. So let's see this step by step. Here I recommend to have one eye on my whiteboard and the other eye on the uh, presentation slides so that you can keep engaged between the circuit and the, uh, and the analysis. Okay, so, here, as you can see, my dear students, we have a typically the same branch, I1, and this is P times I1. And we have our two transistors. and here VPE2 and VPE1. The only difference here, my dear students, is now that we have a mismatching factor called R. So when we are going to write the equations for the, um, the for the voltage, we will say that VPE2 equals KT over Q len I1 over R times IS which are here represents that mismatch parameter, while VBE2 equals KT over Q still, land P times I1 over IS. So now we don't have a typical IS, we have a mismatching factor R between the first one and the second one. This will result on when we have a delta VPE to he K over Q, land P R times T. So as you can see, this mismatching factor between 
um, the, the, the two transistor, um, impacted the, the, the sensitivity term. So instead of having K over Q and B, it becomes K over Q and P times R. So this is the impact. Of course, this impact is, uh, or can be compensated simply by adjusting the value of B. Again, you remember that B is a design parameter. So whenever you detect this mismatching, you can compensate it, but you have to detect it first to be able to compensate. It. So this is the first uh, uh, process here. Now, if you re if you remember, if, or if you still um, see the my presentation slides, you know that there's another difference here. That when instead of having delta VPE, we multiply this by some sort of amplification factor. So, what is the output of this amplifier? Will be alpha k over q len pr times q capital. So this is the first branch, or what we call the V theta. Okay, perfect. Let's go to the added sort branch. So we have an added sort branch, which is simply, and you can source I2, connected to a new transistor. And still, this transistor is shortcutted between the base and the collector, so it's still acting as a bar. And we have here VPE. So instead of having VBE1 or VBE2, I will call this VPE only. So this is VPE equals to KC over Q len I2 over IS2. As you can see, I, I mentioned here IS2 because I don't have any. Um, uh, guarantee to make this IS typically as a first two transistor. So I will call it IS2 in a general manner. And this is I2, which is the current flow in the transistor, uh, uh, this new third transistor. Okay, so back again, if you see my presentation, you will find that the, we call something reference voltage, V reference. So what is a V reference? V reference is simply V, V tag. We, we just calculated plus V, V. So we can say that V reference equals to K over Q len PR uh, times C, of course, plus VP. And here is the equation for VP. But let's turn back to the concept. What is the reference voltage? What is the definition for reference voltage? So what, the, what is this reference or why we call it reference? This will be our main focus in the next part of this lecture. We are going to demonstrate or maybe to justify why we call this a reference voltage. What is the condition to be a reference voltage? What are the sources of error for a reference voltage? How we can change the sensitivity and the, the, the range uh, uh, the limit of sensing for our temperature sensor. This will be considered, inshallah, in the next lecture. Thank you very much, my dear students, for your concentration. I look forward for part two of this lecture.